This is Dr. Robert Watkins, orthopedic spine surgeon to professional athletes and creator of the Back Doctor app. Hey, good evening. How you guys doing? Welcome to Rena Del Rey. I'm Dr. Robert Watkins IV, here with my friend, Dr. Stephen Lombardo, who I'm really honored to have with us today. Uh, Dr. Lombardo has known my father for a long time, and uh, we've known each other. I remember one of my dad's Christmas parties uh, when I first started medical school. I remember having a long conversation with you and how much interest you showed in me being in medical school way back when. That was a while ago. The, it was. The, uh, uh, Dr. Lombardo was the team doctor for the Los Angeles Lakers for 42 years. And he only he looks like he's 45. The, uh, the, uh, so he started young and the King's doctor for almost 20 years. Uh, with the Lakers, uh, 10 NBA championships, uh, and NBA Dream Team, 92 NBA Dream Team, uh, team doctor in Barcelona. What an amazing experience uh, that must have been. And uh, a member of Curl and Job Orthopedic Clinic has been there forever, helped start, uh, was the second fellow ever at Curl and Job, and eventually ran the fellowship program, and as well as the all the research that uh, – you guys produced over the years and your contribution to sports medicine and sports orthopedics is pretty incredible and much less really starting at the beginning of when Bob Curlin and Frank Job set up the clinic and started sports medicine and where it's come today. I'm really excited to have you. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Well, thank you very much. I feel honored to follow in the footsteps of Larry Doerr, the famous orthopedic surgeon and the legend, my, one of my trainers, uh, Gary Vitti. Uh, both premier people in the field of sports medicine. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, they were great having on. Uh, and so tonight, we're pretty much going to talk about uh, Dr. Lombardo's experience in sports medicine and uh, what he's seen. I mean, the changes in medicine, especially orthopedics, and how operating on human beings to get them to play a sport was revolutionary uh, 40 years ago. And nowadays, we take it as a given. So I'm so fascinated to hear your perspective and everything you've seen how the, our world has evolved from your mentors. We'll talk about your mentors, who you learn from, your beginning of getting into the, into the business, and then some of the people you've treated from all the Kings and Lakers and Dream Team and, and everybody else. And then uh, and we'll end with any advice you have for, uh, any, uh, for, for me in the middle of my career and, and what you think uh, is important about our job and what to focus on and pay attention to, and the future of medicine as far as biologics, computer surgery what do you see where do you see things are going what are you excited about the future and what's going on in the future so uh, why don't we start with uh, who were some of your fundamental mentors that uh, trained you and you learned from you inspired you when you were young well two of the pioneers in the sports medicine field were my mentors uh, Dr. Frank Job famous for the Tommy John operation and Dr. Robert Curlin for prolonging the career of Sandy Koufax the Hall of Fame pitcher so uh, I learned from them. I was a second fellow in our office, and uh, fellowships in sports medicine were relatively new, so it was an honor to be part of that office. And uh, during the year that I was a fellow, before they invited me to join the group, uh, which set my journey, started my journey, um, I uh, probably went to 250, 300 games. And I love sports, always did when I was younger. And the office was taking care of four professional teams, the Lakers, the Dodgers, the Kings, and the Rams. So I was going to, I was like a, a little kid in a candy store being able to go to all the games and learning from two of the best uh, in, in the country uh, at that time. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's one of the things my dad's always impressed on me, too, is that you got to love the sports because people think it's, it's glamorous. What doctor doesn't want to take care of athletes and stuff like that? But if you don't love it, you're going to spend a lot of time in locker rooms. You got to be involved in this process. You got to love it to make it worthwhile. Absolutely. Uh, you know, taking care, going to the games is fun, but you have to go there at five, and you leave, get home at eleven o'clock at night. But uh, for me, it was a passion that I've always had. Even when I was younger, I went to a lot of games. Uh, in fact, when I was in training uh, at uh, USC, uh, I went to almost all the games that the Lakers played at home when they won 33, yeah. had a winning streak of 33 games. I yeah. would drive down there. I would buy scalper tickets. The seats weren't quite as good as when I was taking care of the team, but it was still fun doing it. Yeah, right. You didn't have any responsibility. No. <laughs> Even better. No. All right, that's great. What about Bob Curlin? What, uh, describe him for us. Uh, what did you learn from him? 
<clears throat> he had a profound understanding of sports injuries, uh, inflammatory response to microtrauma, and uh, he was an artist at uh, prescribing the correct therapy. Uh, unfortunately, he had uh, a disabling disease, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, had to use crutches. He stopped doing surgery at an early age, but he was a genius. And that's how I started taking care of the Lakers in my very first year in the office. He, he, he was on crutches, and he was the brain, and I was sort of the body and did the surgeries mm -hmm. and that. So yeah. uh, profound understanding of sports, the injuries, what was the proper way of treating them. Um, same thing for Frank Job, a very gifted surgeon. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a very he he created the Tommy John operation. Everyone sort of heard of it. Maybe 15, 20 percent of the Major League Baseball players have had a Tommy John. I remember just anecdotally, yeah. I was assisting Dr. Job in, uh, with the Tommy John. The Tommy John, it was he was left-handed. He tore the ligament on the inside of his elbow. Dr. Job took a tendon from his other arm weaved it back and forth, reconstructed the ligament, and I was assisting him, and I said, Dr. Job, why are you putting it in that location? And he turned to me in his deep voice, and he said, because that's where God wanted it. <laughs> and he was right. And Tommy John won more games after surgery than before surgery. Yeah. And some people, he pitched till he's 42 years of age, and some people would say, Tommy, you're still pitching at 42. He says, yeah. The rest of my body's 42 years of age, but my arm's only seven years old. <laughs> yeah, nice. That's awesome. Yeah, I never, I never realized that with Bob Curlin, you know, one of the hallmarks of treating athletes in the Curlin Job Clinic is the rehab. And I know Frank Job uh, was big into the rehab and the research, but uh, the fact that Curlin could no longer operate and was a specialist in, in injuries and how to recover, because we all know 95% of the athletes we treat, we don't operate on. You have to figure out how to get them back to their sport as quickly as possible and safely. And so that was a big contribution by that, Bob That's Curlin. right. I agree. That yeah. Getting them back as quickly as possible. But uh, the only mistake you can make is having them go back too soon. If it's a week too late, that's not a problem. That's that's what I try to teach the young fellows in our office. So yeah, uh, very critical in, in decision making when they're ready to play. That's an excellent point. One of the hard things that I found is if somebody gets injured and to say that your starting pitcher, your starting something is going to be out for six weeks is hard to say because in the middle of a season, you know, people just about pass out. I mean, that can be crucial. It can cost the whole season. And giving time estimates, you know, as a person, we generally want to be optimistic and hopeful. And so being the del having to deliver bad news, nobody really wants to do that. And sometimes it's hard to say, no, he's going to be out six weeks or she's going to be out six weeks. Just start with that. So sometimes I think, especially as a young surgeon, you may err on the side of, well, I think maybe two weeks, you know, or and we'll try and get back. But in some ways, you're not doing yourself any favors because now you've set the expectation too good when it should be six weeks. And like you said, you're better off if you wait a week. Right. That's right. it. Yeah. I, you know, the other interesting thing is uh, we we're going to get into this later on, but yeah. Dr. Jerry Buss, uh, who was a visionary in the sports world, uh, would say to me, tell me when he's ready to play, and then I'll decide if it, I'm going to let him play then or wait another week or two. So he understood the long-term investment in these players. Uh, yeah. One of the best owners in professional sports. Yeah. That's great. That's really great to hear. Taking care of some of the teams now. I I can tell um, they definitely have a more long-term picture because, like you said, it's an investment. And they also realize, well, if, if, if this player is only at 80%, well, maybe we should go with somebody else who's at 100 until this person gets back to the 100. I think, and for me, the experience has been teams much more conscientious, even over the past five to ten years. Minute management and, and having interchangeable parts where somebody, else, somebody can play two or three different positions, like in baseball, I think that's been a good advance. I agree. I agree. <clears throat> the decision making is, uh, you know, there's a, it's a collective thing. The athlete, the trainer, and the doctor. Yeah. And uh, we we've, we've been gifted with, a, with great trainers. Uh, uh -huh. Gary Vitti was a great trainer, um, and we, and having experience is uh, is very valuable. But I have to say this uh, for the young doctors: uh, you're not expert at everything. Uh, we drafted a guy one year who had a uh, partially healed uh, foot and. No one had seen it before, so in that situation, I sent a disc of his x-rays to three of the renowned foot surgeons in the United States and got their opinion because yeah. there's nothing that replaces experience as far as making the proper decision. Yeah, so true, and, it, and it's, it's something you can't fake when you're young and practice. If you don't have the experience, 
you got to pull in other people and get yeah. their help. Yeah, you can't say I'm going to go review the literature. The, the you know I'm going right. to review the literature because that does that's not helpful. You really need real time experience, and there's always someone that's had more experience than you in certain areas that injuries that are not that common. Yeah. Which do you have, as far as the sports go, do you think one is more challenging to take care of than others? Uh, no, I think uh, the body's the same in all the sports, and there's more common injuries, obviously, in, in basketball. There's yeah. ankle sprains, you know, not not career-ending. And uh, some of the advances that we've had is uh, uh, the Tommy John, you know, a high percentage of Major League Baseball players have had Tommy John operations. Forty years ago, an ACL injury was career-ending. Now... 15% of the people that come in and are drafted have had it done. So yeah. there's been major advances in terms of injuries and a solution to the injury and the athlete going back and playing. Yeah. Do you think uh, there's been any downside? Do you think we've gotten overly aggressive and operating on people to play sports? Or the, how about the, the youth that are training these days um, on a consistent basis? Or even kids, what's the youngest... Uh, What's the youngest a kid who's had a Tommy John surgery? There are teenagers, and I, I think that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, where I came from, you played three sports. Yeah. If somebody's very good, little leaguer, parents inadvertently may have them playing two seasons of baseball on that. And I think yeah. the body needs rest. You know, yeah. year-round year sports, uh, I think there's a higher incidence of overuse and development of chronic problems that may curtail a potentially good career yeah yeah that's something that i've gotten more my kids are 13 and 11 now and something i tell more people advice now sometimes the body needs to grow into and mature and develop and playing the same sport over and over again when you're 16 17 years old sometimes your body's just not ready for that i agree i agree the um so let's uh, move on to some of the uh, – who are some of your favorite Lakers that you've uh, been a part of taking care of through the years? Well, my most favorite non-playing Laker was Dr. Jerry Buss. He was uh, a visionary. Uh, he revolutionized professional sports. He, uh, he bought the Kings, the Lakers, and the Forum for $67 million. Um, he – had a player by the name of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar that the Lakers got in 1975. Kareem uh, demanded a trade. He was in Milwaukee. It didn't meet his cultural needs, so they got a great player. And then in 79, when Dr. Buss bought the team, uh, they had Magic Johnson. So um, that that was those were the ingredients uh, for championship teams, and he he revolutionized the sport. He was the very first owner that sold the naming rights to the Forum, to the Great Western Bank. He had the Laker dance girls. He had an up-tempo offense that he got the proper coach, had the proper players, and uh, called Showtime. And it was yeah. uh, very entertaining. It led to, uh, while Magic was playing, five championships. Yeah, absolutely. What, and Dr. Buss, as a, as a, as a decision-maker, what was one of his? What was his forte? Did he hire good people and let them do their jobs, uh, or would he ultimately step in and make the final call? How did he make it? How did he process? He was a very good communicator, and I think he found a, a good fit in terms of the coaches for the talent. You know, he had yeah. a very. The first championship that we won when I was taking care of the team was uh, with Paul Westfall, Paul Westhead, and then Pat Riley took over for him. He won four championships, and he. Riley was a perfect fit. Uh, he was very detailed. And then he brought in Phil Jackson and for Kobe and Shaq. So yeah. he picked the right people, and he had the right players. I mean, you're not, you're right. not going to win just with anyone, but right. he had the right players. He picked the right people that were a good fit for the talent uh, and, and the personnel that the Lakers had. Yeah. Did you have any tough injuries in those, 80, in those days of the 80s in the Lakers-Celtic battles? Did you have any tough injuries to deal with? Uh, no, you know, the, I operated on Magic, I operated yeah. on James Worthy, he had a fractured knee, and I uh, operated on Kareem, and they all recovered. Uh, if, if you're well-trained, uh, I don't, in my experience, nothing yeah. was difficult. It was, yeah. I had been adequately trained to be able to handle things that I saw. Right. So. And were all three of those, uh, they pretty much did w the rehab and did what they needed to do to get back. They all seemed like the ultimate professionals. Very compliant. Yeah, who was the biggest knucklehead you ever took care of? Uh, 
Well, probably Shaq. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, uh, tell us about Shaq. What was well, he like? Uh, I had a good relationship with him. Yeah. Um, in 1996, uh, the great general manager, Jerry West, provided two winning lotto tickets to the Lakers. He stole Shaquille O'Neal from Orlando. Yeah. And the same year, he traded one of the top five centers in the league, Velati Divax, uh, to Charlotte for their first-round pick, who was a 13th pick overall, a player by the name of Kobe Bryant. Yeah. So my theory, and I didn't learn this in med school, is if you have two superstars, yeah. that's a start to having championship teams. So yeah. in one year, Jerry West provided that, which led to three championships with Kobe and Shaq. Right. So um, in, the, in the first or second year, Shaq had an injury, and uh, he tore his medial collateral ligament in his knee, and I had a make a special trip in. He was on the road, and I examined him, and I told him um, four to six weeks. And uh, at the three-week mark, he said, I'm, I'm going to play. And uh, he still had some swelling in the knee, yeah. and he had 80% of his motion. I said, I don't, that's not my recommendation. He, says, he said, dude, <laughs> I'm playing. <laughs> so the general manager called me, and I gave him his, my opinion, and Jerry West told him no. And then he went to the to Dr. Buss. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Buss called me and he wouldn't let him play. Uh -huh. And interestingly, the next day he went to the training facility and the press was there and the press said, what did Dr. Lombardo say about your knee? Yeah. And his response was, who's Dr. Lombardo? <laughs> That's good. So, so it absolved you. So, <laughs> so we, got on, we got on speaking terms another week or two. He <laughs> he, he forgave me, but he didn't forget. And about two months yeah. later, yeah. I asked him if he would sign one of his size 22 shoes. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. And what he did was, I don't know if you can see it or not, but he <laughs> yeah, wrote to Dr. Lombardo. Where is it? Oh, there it is, yeah. To Dr. Lombardo. Yeah. Six to eight weeks, so he didn't forget. <laughs> you know, Six so, to eight weeks. Yeah. That's so, classic. Anyway, um, <laughs> he he was he was special. Uh, yeah. One one time he uh, he cut his finger during a playoff game against San Antonio. His index finger in his right hand, and mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that he didn't cut his digital nerve. And I had a needle, and I was going to test the sensation. He was in the locker room, and Phil Jackson had the ball boys coming in because they got, weren't going to win without Shaq. And it was yeah. in the middle of the game. And he says, uh, I had a needle. I was going to test the sensation. He says, what are you going to do with that needle, you? And I said, <laughs> I'm going to make sure you didn't cut your digital nerve. And he says, no, you're not. Yeah. So I numbed his finger. Yeah. Sutured it up. Yeah. He stands up, put a Band-Aid on him. He says, give me a ball. And so he holds the ball and he looks at me and says, my finger's numb. Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, Shaq, that's the only way I could sew you up. Right. He says, I can't play like this. Yeah. So I said, Shaq, for all the money they're paying you, go out there and see what you can do. Yeah. So he went out there, and he made like five out of five free throws. <laughs> nice. Which for him is unheard of because yeah. he was like a 50% shooter. Yeah. So what happens? He wants you to numb it every game. I had to <laughs> numb it the next game. And then he, at the end of the game, he slam dunked, ripped it open again. Yeah. And comes in the locker room and says some ridiculous thing like, this space on your finger only is enough for three, four stitches at the most. He says, yeah. some ridiculous request, like, I want you to put eight or nine in. Right. And I says, there's not enough room. Yeah. He says, if you don't, I'm not going to play. Yeah. So I put a whole bunch of stitches in, and then I said, go have VD put a Band-Aid on it. And so he's walking away, looking at his finger, and he turns around at me and says, I told you eight, and there's only seven. <laughs> so I had to put another one in. But <laughs> at the same time, one year he got a new contract. We won a championship, yeah. and there were twelve, there were thirteen, fourteen guys in training camp, and he bought all of them a Rolex watch. So mm -hmm. he had a really great side to him. But, yeah, but he he always had to be on your toes. One time I went in the locker room, and he would get taped on one side of the room, and Kobe would get taped on the other side of the room, mm -hmm. and he he called me over before the game as he's getting taped. Hey, dog, come here. He says, he points over the other side of the room and says there's your boy over there. Mm -hmm. And I said, Shaq, 
I don't have any boys. You're all my children. Right. So he, he was an interesting guy. Yeah. And yeah. he was a challenge for Phil Jackson at times. Uh-huh. You know, to, He's got a strong know, personality, doesn't he? Very strong, very opinionated. And mm-hmm. uh, he uh, he knew he was in the driver's seat. If he, if he didn't do what you wanted him to do in terms of the coaching staff, what, are they going to sus- – a superstar, are they going to suspend him? Right. No. Right. Are they going to trade him? No. Right. Are they going to fine him? No, because, right. and so so they know that. Yeah. So, but I thoroughly enjoyed taking care of him. Uh, great personality. Um, yeah. And one of the greatest centers of all time. Yeah, absolutely. His daughter and my son actually went to elementary school together. And uh, we're best friends, Miara. They still keep in touch. But Shaq, he, he could barely come to the school because he would just get swarmed. But he did come one time, and he was so generous with his time with all the kids. And he's such a, a fun-loving guy. But watching him dominate people on the basketball court was like nothing you've ever seen before. huh? Just literally dunking over people was pretty a sight to behold. You're right. When he played for Orlando and we had Vladi Divax, who was a great center, when, he came, when Vladi came back from playing against Shaq, it was like he, his chest was bruised, he, his joints hurt. It was like a truck had run over him. Yeah. You know? yeah. Not something that you would want to go up against every day. So yeah. he was a very, very dominant, talented player. How was he with injuries? Uh, I remember, you know, some of the years, uh, the, the championship run, he'd have some injuries and then kind of, you know, God forbid, take an off season. And, and one year he didn't have surgery for a while, then had surgery and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, what a grind to do the whole play. The way the NBA extended the playoffs and the finals to cover another two months so that these guys would get literally, and the doctors would literally get almost no off season. And so he, uh, you know, he kind of took some heat for not being in shape and not showing up in shape and stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, uh, he always seemed to pull it together around the end of the season. How was he with his rehab and just his, his work ethic? He was pretty compliant. You yeah. Know, one, one year he got heavily criticized because he didn't, he, he, he made a statement to the newspaper that he didn't want it, uh, the, the surgery to interfere with the summer. You know, right. well, you know come on. <laughs> right. You know, you know, on the other hand, Kobe um, was not my favorite player, but I had the highest respect for Kobe of any player I ever encountered. He had the greatest work ethic. Yeah. He worked on his game year-round. If he made an impossible shot, I guarantee you he practiced that shot 100 times. 500 times yeah he was he was every year he got better he really did. and he was tough I mean he played hurt one time he fractured he came back from a trip uh, in the midwest and he said the doctor said his knuckle uh, he hurt his knuckle and I examined him and I was pretty sure that he fractured the long bone in his hand the metacarpal and I x-rayed his hand and he had a fracture and I said four to six weeks he said I'm going to play I said, well, that's fine with me, Kobe. If you play, the first time someone hits you on your hand, the bone's going to pop right through the skin. Yeah. He didn't play. <laughs> yeah, right. But he was, he was a real gamer. Yeah. The high, I have the highest regard for him in terms of work ethic, playing hurt, uh, and being the mo- one of the most competitive guys I ever encountered in sports. Yeah, what you said about him working on those difficult shots, that's what, you know, for me, the difference between Kobe and Jordan is Kobe made more difficult shots than Jordan ever even tried. And Kobe would just, but like you said, he, he practiced them. And so it wasn't, it seemed like a miracle he was just throwing up there, but he, he would make a significant amount. He made a three-point at one time with a couple of guys draped over him in the, from the baseline to win a game. And we had a player from Gonzaga, his name was Turia, a French guy. Yeah. And he said to him after the game, you lucky, SOB. And, yeah. and, and Kobe said, what are you talking about? He said, making that shot. And yeah. his response to Turia was, have you ever watched Larry's Legends tape? And Turiaf didn't know what he's talking about. Well, all the greatest shots that Larry Bird made, Magic studied, not Magic, yeah. Kobe studied the tape, yeah. practiced those shots over and over again. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and he uh-huh. would do the same preparation for the games. He studied the offensive tendencies, the defensive tendencies of the players he was he was playing against. Yeah. I mean, he was very, very, he was a very, very bright, very intelligent basketball player, and very skilled. You know, I think, I. I heard Gary Vitti, I, I think, for his position, he wasn't as strong as Shaq or some of the other players, but yeah. for his position, he was very skilled, and he even enhanced it by his work ethic. Yeah, it's awesome. The um, What about uh, going back to the 80s in L.A., uh, Wayne Gretzky, you were taking care of the Kings when Ray, Wayne Gretzky arrived in L.A. I mean, that was such a magical time. It changed the sport of hockey, didn't it? 
they, from, they lived in the shadow of the Lakers, and, and then Bruce McNall became sole owner of the team. Yeah. And the first thing he did was pay $15 million to bring Wayne Gretzky into town. He changed the color of the uniforms to black and white. He bought it, an airplane from the president of Mexico. And then I was on the plane one time. We're going to the playoffs. And uh, Bruce McNall says, Doc, you like the food? I says, very, very good. He says, Spago's. Yeah, nice. So we had the food catered from Spago's for the hockey players. Yeah. The only no. problem was that a lot of the things he was doing, it was with other people's money. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, on retrospect. So he, and he went to jail for it. But <laughs> right. My encounters with him were very, very pleasant. Yeah. Yeah, that was an awesome run. For me, hockey used to be just this mass chaos. And then... Gretzky shows up, and all of a sudden he'd get the puck behind the net, and the whole game would slow down. And all of a sudden you could see people cutting in front of the net, him making passes. It was like, the whole oh, there's actually, now you can see what's going on in this sport. He was the most skilled player I've ever seen in hockey. Yeah, yeah. and what was he like as a guy? He, he was, still is, yeah. I, 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 I liked him a great deal. He, yeah. he was humble in my presence and with the press, and uh, he was very articulate and... Uh, and it, it, no one had the, his skill level. He, it, his peer group, did, you know, his skill level was way beyond his peer group. Yeah. So, and you know, if you look at tapes, highlights of him, you'd be shocked at how good he was. Oh, yeah. With handling the puck, starting, stopping. Great hockey, guy. Hockey players are amazing to take care of, too, aren't they? For us, our surgical results that we look at, the hockey players, we get the best results. They make us look good because they all go back and play. The, uh, and they're also down to earth and uh, just genuine people. Did you find that too? very tough? Very, very tough group of people. Um, the two toughest groups that I've taken care of: rodeos guys and hockey players. I remember one time we had a player by the name of Murray Nichols. He tore his medial collateral ligament in his knee, and Vince Carter, who was my associate, took care of the team. Uh, we did it together. Uh, we went in the other room to discuss whether we we're going to do surgery on him. We went yeah. back to tell him he was back playing on the ice. Yeah. So. <laughs> That so. was not an uncommon thing. So. Let me tell you a quick story about Vince Carter because it's one of my favorite. In my training at County Hospital, I'm in OR Room 1, which didn't have any air conditioning, so we have the windows down to get some air in there. And Vince Carter was my attending, and I'm trying to do an amputation, a below-knee amputation. I had no idea what I was doing. So I'm kind of, you know, working away, trying to get something done and just completely flailing away. And, and Dr. Carter was so gracious and to me. He literally was just yelling at the scrub tech. Will somebody give my man an instrument so he can do what he needs to do? Trying to deflect the pressure off me because he clearly had no idea what I was doing. But he was a great guy, wasn't he? He was a great doctor. He was a great person. Really you know, and, I, and I've been, you know, I've been very fortunate. I have, I've been in a great, one of the best offices of sports medicine in the United States. Great associates, very talented, um, and worked very well together as a team. So it was a. Uh, my journey has been a very, very pleasant one. Yeah. How many fellows uh, retiring? How many fellows have come through your guys' program? It's going to be 250. I was the second one, but yeah. there was only one a year when I took the fellowship. Now that we have eight, so the, uh, that's a lot. And those surgeons are all over the country now, taking care of just about every team in America of every a lot sport. Of, a lot, you know, a lot of them taking care of professional teams. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great experience. So. The uh, what about the dream team? That was one of the highlights of my career. It was a six-week commitment. Uh, uh, went to San Diego for a week uh, to get to know each other, and then we went to Portland to qualify in a Tournament of Americas, and then we went to Monaco uh, to acclimatize, and then two weeks in Barcelona. So yeah. one of, I think one of the conditions under which Jordan played on the team was that we had to play golf every day because it was a van almost every day outside our hotel to take us to a golf course. Yeah. So it was nice. it was 11 Hall of Fame players and one college player uh, Christian Leighton. Uh -huh. So um, great group. Uh, people ask me who was your favorite? Well, there wasn't a close second to Charles Barkley. He he socialized with the team. He came out to eat with us. Multiple times he would say, "I can't believe I'm getting paid when I'm getting paid to play this sport." You know. So he was very very appreciative. And this past March, uh, he on the air when he was doing uh, the, the the basketball tournament, yeah. he said the two highlights of his career is commentating March Madness mm -hmm. and being a member of the Dream Team. Yeah. By the way, he had the highest scoring percentage, and he had, he was the highest points per game of the Dream Team. Yeah, of all the great players, and that was just such a unique time, wasn't it? Because before then. 
the players kind of hated each other. There were the rivalries, and, and there wasn't, you know, people, they weren't as connected. And the Dream Team was the first time we ever even imagined Bird and Magic being on the same team, much less Jordan. He, you know, he was the new uh, rival coming in who had really just kind of taken over. And so the, that must have been a really special time and a privileged time for you to get the access to see these guys hanging out for the first time. Really. Very fortunate. And, and, and the press internationally and, and, and domestically said, the greatest team ever assembled. Yeah. And and it, I think it was. Oh, you know, yeah. Interestingly, we had our own hotel, um, and some of the athletes complained that we weren't in the village. So one day the team went to the village, and they had four security guys, and all the athletes from all the countries, you know, hundreds came out. To, and it was it was like running of the bulls, you know, the safety. Yeah. So we, we never went back to the village again because <laughs> – right. You know, they, they were celebrity, world celebrities at presence in the Olympic Village. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and Barkley, it seems like, if I'm not mistaken, he may have made kind of a shift in his career at that time because, and I heard him mention before about how he, uh, uh, Moses Malone said, you're fat and out of shape, you got to get in shape, and that Bar- Barkley started working hard. And I think 92, around that time, uh, I remember him walking down Las Ramblas in Barcelona, right, and, all, and and everybody following him and taking autographs. And it seemed like he kind of made a transition where he came back after that and then really blossomed and became the MVP and uh, he was, was great, unstoppable. He was a great person and a great player. Yeah, he's very very talented, very talented. Yeah, and hilarious. He's, he's he was funny. Him. My two sons were part time ball boys. They were eight and ten, and he would call my sons the Chump Brothers. And after the Olympics, he was playing for Phoenix, and he. They're, they came to the forum one night. This was in the 90s before we moved to Staples. Yeah. And he saw my two boys, and he came over to them. And like that are 8- and 10-year-olds. And he says, hey, chump boys, I hate to tell you this, but we're going to kick your ass tonight. <laughs> nice. And they thought that was so cool that yeah. an adult would talk to them that Yeah, way. right. So, yeah. But very consistently a good person. Yeah, that's awesome. The... Um so what do you see uh, going forward in medicine? The, um, we've seen the advent of sports medicine and athletes getting back. I mean, arthroscopic surgery, you've seen the advent of that, which has revolutionized how we cause less trauma to tissues and are actually able to accomplish surgeries. Now we see stem cells coming out, computer-guided surgery. What do you, uh, do you, do you have any perspective on the biologic, the stem cells? And, and uh... Uh, No, I don't. I think uh, it's still investigational. We have a, a specialist in the office that does it, but there's not any hard scientific data yet that supports the idea of someone paying four to $6,000 for stem cells, and yeah. the results aren't there yet. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe it will be, but uh, they're still doing it, but... Uh, there's not uh, hard scientific data that I, it's very important for us. You can't just randomly do something. Yeah. You know, it has to be proven that it's, it can be successful. You know, steroids, in most cases, can do the same things as stem cells do. So, yeah. uh, you know, I think robotics is going to have a place in sports medicine. Uh, uh, the techniques for ACL surgeries, for shoulder instability has dramatically improved. Uh, where the robotics are used more commonly now are in joint replacements. Uh, yeah. But and, and someday... Uh, the next generation, I'm sure robotics will play a major role with sports uh, injury surgeries. Yeah, that'll be fascinating. In our business, we use some computer navigation, but it's still all the surgeon doing the work. And uh, like I said, total knees, total joints, making the saw cuts. I never liked doing total knees because I felt like you're making these saw cuts and you're going to affect this joint for the rest of your life. And how do you, you know, so much of it is you used to just cut the thing. But having the precision. Yeah, it used to be eyeballing, but now it's totally computerized the way they do it. So there's a high level of precision in what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like an automobile. You know, you're not just putting parts in. You know, robotics are doing, putting the cars together now. So Yeah. Uh, and, I, and that's the future for, for – uh, and, 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 of course, the biologics, I think uh, they'll arrive at something that will be revolutionary. We'll heal rotated cuffs without uh, – you know, surgeries, you know, and, you know, mesenchymal cells and yeah. stem cells and things like that. Yeah, it'd be fascinating. Big future. Yeah. Do you have any advice for me? I'm my 16 years in practice. I'm kind of at the middle roads. I got another half of my career to go. You got any advice for me? As to... I don't have any advice for you because you've got your father's one of the best <laughs> spine surgeons in the world. And I'm sure he's already imparted uh, uh, advice on what to do. I, I just think that to uh, be a good spine doctor or sports doctor, you need to have command of uh, the knowledge and information uh, and the surgical techniques and uh, uh, know your limits. I think that's what I try to teach the younger doctors. You don't yeah. don't go outside the boundaries of 
what you're very comfortable and what you're very knowledgeable and expert at. So, yeah. uh, you know, there's specialists for everything. Now, when I first started, I did foot surgery, I was doing hand surgeries. Now we've got two foot guys in the office. We have two hand guys in the office. We have a biologic guy. Uh, we have a joint replacement guy. Um, there's hip arthroscopy. So uh, I think the important thing is to be well-trained uh, by knowledgeable, expert people and to carry that over. And most, and it's a wonderful profession. That's why I'm still practicing. You take care of people, and they're very grateful. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's very important to be able to communicate to your patients. I think that's the number that, the, the most important thing to be a good doctor is to be able to communicate to your patients. Yeah. Every patient that I go in and see, I bring a model in and show them on the knee model, the shoulder model, the elbow model, what's wrong with them. And then I won't let them re leave the room until I say, now tell me what's wrong with you. And they get a quiz. Oh, yeah? And I say, if you don't get this right, I kept the patient here two days for yeah. one time. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. I, I think communication is very important because... Yeah. It creates a peace of mind, and psychologically, uh, the patient has a high comfort uh, zone with what's being done, and I think that's 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 yeah. very important. Yeah, I think it is something we take for granted sometimes. That uh, taking the time to explain it to somebody, you can help them so much, mentally and emotionally, and even physically, just by explaining them what's going on. Their understanding of it is probably eighty percent of the healing process. Absolutely, <clears throat> you know, and I encourage them to look up WebMD and. I write down the names, so I had adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder, and I said, this is what you have. I tried to explain it to you, now you go home and read about it. So yeah. um, I think if you take a patient out of mystery and what's going on and they have an understanding what the problem is and what the solutions are, uh, that you're halfway there to having a therapeutic good result. Yeah, that's great. And it's true for the athletes, too, and for them to have an understanding of exactly what's going on, what's the risk, what chance are they taking by playing so they can make an educated decision, and then um, we can all decide. Sometimes it just comes down to the owner saying yes or no. But, you know. Absolutely. Good owners, you know, good good staff, good support staff. It's not a one-man show. So yeah. uh, and I've, we've been very, I've been very fortunate to be associated you know, I have peers that have teams that never won a championship, never been to the finals. Uh, during my 42 years, I think we went to the finals 18 times. Uh, we won 10 championships, and uh, uh, the whole organization was was top notch. And I I think it comes from the top down. Yeah, it's a, it's a collective team effort. You'll have to send us a picture with all your rings on. The uh, if, you, right. if, you, if you get them all on your hands, if you right. cook, I usually a wear them. Picture. I usually wear them all in Vegas when I uh, I'm gambling. I, yeah, I, I don't even I don't even go to Vegas. <laughs> all trust right, me. right. You all need right. some house credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming. That was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Yeah, it was My great. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, uh, if anyone has any questions, they can yeah go to you, and I'm happy <clears> to answer them. You got to please do. If you have any questions, feel free to put it in the comments and. Uh, I'll reach out to Steve and I'll, I'll respond. And uh, he's going to get uh, his own podcast channel, and I'll put the link on there. You're going to write a book. I'm going to hold it to you. you got to write a book about all your experiences. It would be great to have. But thank you for being here. I appreciate uh, it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thanks, guys. Bye.